The Holy Spirit knows how much you can handle. In Session 8, Throw Off the Weight, see how you should respond to the pressures of life and why you should embrace the training God has designed to build you up in faith. We are now on Session 8, and the title of this session is Throw Off the Weight, and the material we're covering is Chapter 11. You can be seated, and let's get right into Session 8, Throw Off the Weight. I'm going to open up again with Peter's words. Remember, we're dissecting his words here for the rest of the sessions up until the 12th. Peter says, all of you be submitted to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him for he cares for you. A prime aspect of clothing ourselves with humility is to come under God's mission as seen with Caleb and Joshua. All adversaries standing between our present position and the completion of our divine mission is to be viewed as conquerable. That is a good place to say amen. All adversity standing between our present position and the completion of our divine mission is to be viewed as conquerable. We base our calculations on his strength or mighty hand. We believe his word, even over what logic or reason dictates. We become people who walk by faith, not ruled by senses or the natural. Can you say amen? amen. To realistically live in this manner, we must become a people who cast all of our cares upon him. This is what Caleb and Joshua did in regard to their wives and children. They were fathers, they were husbands, and they too should have been concerned for their families. However, in their view, the word of the Lord took precedence. They understood in putting God's will first, their families, who were their greatest care, would be protected and provided for. They were truly humble. As a result, their family concerns were the most capable hands of the universe, for he cares for us. Casting all of our care on God gives us the ability to remain relentless in our mission. In order to press on, we cannot carry cumbersome weights. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Yeah. Weights slow us down and can keep us from finishing well. Can you imagine running a marathon with two 45 pound plates on your side? <laughs> There's just no way you can do it. A heavy weight that hinders our continual progress is our cares or our concerns. It is the very thing that weighed down the 10 spies who did not finish. It is important to note our families are not the weight. It is the concern for our families that becomes the weight. In questioning God's ability to provide and protect, we insult his integrity and we insult his strength. It's interesting to note that Caleb and Joshua eventually proved the error of their contemporaries. 40 years later, they indeed went into battle with the same Canaanites, yet their families were not harmed in any way. In fact, it ended up blessing their wives and children by giving them a fruitful land for their inheritance instead of the desert, which the other 10 inherited. Think through the different outcomes. The 10 spies sought to protect their families over the directive of God's words. They caused their families to inherit the desert. Joshua and Caleb believed their families inherited the promised land and the promised land for us speaks of abundance. At various times, now I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. At various times in our lives, each of us will have to choose between security and destiny. Will we choose the path leading to significance or attempt to secure our well-being? If you choose the course of self-preservation, its end will not be your divine destiny. You may succeed in maintaining your comfort and security, but you'll eventually discover the fullness of life you forsook at the judgment seat of Christ. It's a fact. If you are going to fulfill your God-designed journey, you'll have to leave the weight of your cares and concerns with him, for his path often goes against what dictates security and comfort. As a young man growing up, it was drilled into me, the importance of providing for my family. 
My dad taught me a penny saved is a penny earned. I have one of the most amazing dads. That man provided so beautifully for our family and really modeled how to do that for me. And so when I got married to Lisa, my greatest, greatest desire was to be a good provider. And so I remember getting, you know, I was going to become an airline pilot. That's what I really wanted to do. And I was going to go down to Embry-Riddle in Florida, and I was going to get a pilot's license and be a commercial airline pilot. My dad discouraged me. He said, son, that's not a good career. It's not stable. He said, become an engineer. You're very good at math and science. So I did what my dad said, and I became an engineer. And I came out of college, and I remember I got saved in college, and I felt this tug to the ministry. And I came out of college, and I got a job with Rockwell International, and we were in Dallas, Texas, in a very large church. And I remember, you know, the first couple years working for Rockwell, I was making a real handsome salary as a junior engineer. Matter of fact, probably the best salary a college graduate could make back in that time. And I remember, you know, we, I married Lisa, but the problem was I still had this tug to preach the gospel that the Holy Spirit kept witnessing in my heart. And so Lisa and I, you know, we, we, we were just kind of talked about it. And we said, you know what? Let's just do this. I had heard from another employee at Rockwell that if us employees, if, if we went over to the Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia, that they would give us a huge salary. And I had friends at Rockwell that did that, and they gave them enormous salaries for going to Saudi Arabia. And I, Lisa and I, we talked about the plan, and we said, you know, let's take a job in Saudi Arabia with Rockwell. Let's go to the personnel lady, and I did that. And let's go over there. Lisa said, you know, I'll put up with all that stuff and we'll get a huge salary. We'll get a lot of money and we'll come back to America. We'll buy a small, modest house and then we'll pay off that house with a lot of money that we made at, at, in Saudi Arabia and we'll go into the ministry and we won't have to ask people for money. Sounded like a great plan. But it was all based on our ability and our calculations and our efforts. And I remember, you know, I'm, I'm going to the personnel lady at Rockwell and this young man that was in our church who was a real, real great man of God, he pulled me aside one night. And he said, I'd like you to come to my house. I want to talk to you. So they were good friends of ours. And I went over to Tony's house. And Tony, for two solid hours, rebuked me up one side and down the other. He said, there is a call of God on your life. What are you doing about it? If you keep going the direction that you're going, you're going to be an old engineer and you're going to miss your destiny. And I remember leaving that two-hour rebuke and I went home to my wife. Thank God for young friends like that. Amen? Amen? I'll be forever grateful to him. And I looked at my wife and I said, Lisa, I'm going to walk through the first door that God opens to us. I'm going to make it known that I'm available to serve at, at Arbor Church. And the first door that opens, I'm going to walk through it. And I'm going to do it. Are you with me? She said, baby, I'm with you. And so I remember, I, you know, I was very involved in my church. I was an usher. I was also in the prison ministry and the detention home ministry. And I taught my pastor's kids tennis lessons because I was a NCAA college tennis player and, and I taught tennis for three years as a tennis professional at a swim and racket club. And I remember a couple months after I said that to Lisa, a door opened up at my church. And I remember the pastor's wife said, I want you to become the pastors of my executive assistant. Basically, it was a glorified title for Gopher. I took care of their personal businesses, like buying groceries, wash their cars, got their kids from school, stuff like that. And I said, I'd love to come work for you. She said, I don't know if we can afford you. I said, you can afford me. Well, I remember they gave me a nice modest salary of $18,000 a year. And I remember when Lisa and I sat down and we calculated our bills, our bills and our salary just didn't match up. We were a little short on every month. I mean, we had just enough to cover bills, but we didn't have anything left over for jeans or shoes. Nothing. And I remember watching God provide for us in those first couple of years in the most magnificent way. Man, we'd literally watch God come through time and time and time and time again. But it was always by the skin of our teeth. And I remember one time we had to choose on whether we were going to buy groceries or we were going to tithe. For Lisa and I, it was no decision at all. God was first, and we're paying our tithe, baby. So we brought our tithe to church that Sunday morning, and I was getting paid for another 12 days or 10 or 12 days. And we had to buy groceries. All the other income was going to other things. You understand what I'm saying? One of them was our car. It was like the perfect storm. I remember, you know, we had one car. It was this Ford Granada. And it was Lisa's car that I inherited in marrying her. And, um, <laughs> and I... And I, and, I, and I remember, this was amazing. 
You know, one day I came home from work and I tried to start a car and it wouldn't start. The alternator was gone. It was done. It was fried. I thought, oh boy. But you know what? I got the church van, so I'm able to get back and forth to church and I'm so busy working at the church, I just ignored it. Plus the fact it's a lot of money to fix your alternator and I didn't have any money because I had to buy groceries. And then I came back from work a couple days later and the back tire was flat. And to make matters worse, the spare was no good. So now I got no alternator and I got a flat tire and I got a car sitting out in our apartment parking lot that's baking by the Dallas Sun. Well, a few days later, I came home from work. This is, no, this, is, this is not exaggerated. This is the absolute truth. And the passenger side window was shattered into hundreds and hundreds of pieces, all inside the car and outside the car. It had gotten so hot in Dallas that the air expanded on the inside and busted out the window. Now I've got an exposed car with a flat tire with an alternator problem. So we covered up the window with a nice hefty garbage bag. But I'm sitting there at night lying awake. All it's going to take is a little bit of wind and a good rainstorm. And that car is going to be flooded. And it's going to sit there and literally rot between the rain and the hot sun of Dallas. I was getting very frustrated. If I was still an engineer, I could have easily gone out and fixed that thing. And so I'm calling garages and the prices are just like way too much. I don't have the money. So I got into a quiet place and I was angry. I was completely fed up. And I'll never forget, the Bible says in the book of Philippians, it says, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. If you do this, you'll experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than human mind can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mind. Well, let me tell you, I had no peace at all. But I got into this place and I remember, I, I'm telling you, I wasn't praying timidly. I was boldly coming to the throne of grace. And I said, God, you're the one that told me to do this. You are the one that's my provider. That car's going to rot. And this has been plaguing me. So I am today, right now, officially giving you this care. If that car rots, it is not my problem. It's yours. <laughs> that's literally what I said. Then I went after the devil. I said, devil, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I'm a tither. You need to get that money into my hands. Let go of it. It belongs to me. Now listen, for the first time, I started feeling peace. I started feeling peace. I started having joy. I started laughing hysterically. I thought, am I nuts? Have I lost my mind? But I was laughing. It was coming from here. The joy of the Lord, your strength, the Bible says, right? And so I remember the next day, Lisa had a friend come over and she saw the eyesore of a car sitting in the apartment parking lot. And she said, Lisa, I couldn't help notice your car out there. Um, <laughs> You know, I've got a friend who's a mechanic. Do you want me to call him and see if he can help you guys? So she calls the mechanic. He gets the entire car fixed just like that and charges us pennies. I was able to afford it and pay him. Now we still got the situation where we got to buy groceries. A couple days later, a couple from San Antonio walked up to Lisa and I. And he said, we don't know why, but we just, th these people are from San Antonio. They have no idea we have needs. I mean, Lisa had just sat in our car a couple nights earlier and cried. We weren't crying out of unbelief. We were just so frustrated. Why are we going through all these battles? All the other pastors on the staff, all the other people on the staff, they just have money. We don't have any money. Why are we going through this? What I didn't realize is it was God was permitting this training ground to prepare us for the future. Our muscles were being strengthened. Now I remember this couple walks up to us from San Antonio. He said, we don't know why, but we've just been feeling this all week, so here. And hands me an envelope, open up the envelope, and it's a check for $200. Let me tell you something, we never came close to lacking again. But then what happened is we went to Florida and we became youth pastors of a very prominent church and took another huge salary cut. Now again, we've got two babies. Excuse me, we've got one child, and one baby was coming while we were youth pastors. Now our needs are even greater, but yet we're getting a very, very, very low salary. And again, we watch God provide for us in the most magnificent ways. But then what happened is in September of 1988, I was out praying and God says, I'm going to remove you from being youth pastor and I'm going to send you all over America and I'm going to have you preach my word. And I'll never forget that. And remember when he spoke that to me, I thought, okay, you're going to have to tell my pastor because I told my pastor, I said, I'm here till Jesus comes unless God speaks to you and me. And I remember I said nothing 
to anybody when God told me that he was gonna remove me from being youth pastor and send me all over the nation to preach. I said nothing to anybody but my wife and a friend in another state. And do you know, five months later, February of 1989, my pastor walked into the meeting. There's 11 of us associate pastors. And he said, gentlemen and lady, God had gave me a vision last night. I saw one of you is not gonna be on this staff much longer. You're gonna be traveling all over and preaching the word of God. And he said, that man is you, John Bevere. Spirit of God fell on me and began to cry. I said, well, how? He says, I don't know how it's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen. Well, what happened was in August of that year, I got seven invitations from all over America, all over, one hour from the Canadian border, on the Mexican border. One was in the West Coast in California, and the other one was on the East Coast of Florida where you could see the ocean from where you were preaching. I went to my pastor. I said, I've gotten these seven invitations. What do I do? He started laughing. He said, I prophesied. It looks like you're going. <laughs> he said, why don't we pay your salary for the rest of this fall? It was August. We'll pay the, your salary the rest of this fall. January 1, you're on your own. He said, you travel all you want. You go to these seven places, and then you're on your own starting January 1st. I said, sounds like a plan. I was so excited. So I went to those seven places that fall. It was wonderful, but nobody else was asking me to come preach because nobody knew who I was. You understand? So we came to the end of November, and my pastor started getting a little concerned because he saw that I was coming off salary in about five weeks, and... I had no invitations. So he gave me a letter of recommendation that was remarkable and the addresses of 600 churches that he himself had preached at. And he said, you can do whatever you want. Now this was a really well-known man. He was known all over the world and he had a national television program live every week. He said, John, he said, you, just, you can just do whatever you want with these 600 church addresses. So naturally, what do I do? I make a copy of his letter and I write, make a copy of my own letter and I'm addressing his stationery to these 600 churches. I'm gonna send it out, right? I'm about the 40th envelope and the spirit of God comes on me and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm letting pastors know I'm available. He said, you'll get out of my will. I said, God, nobody out there knows me. He said, I do trust me. So at that point now, I've got a choice. I'm either going to depend on my own ability to secure my future or I'm going to choose humility, true humility, and listen to God's directive. So I took those 40 envelopes and tore them up and got rid of the evidence. You understand what I'm talking about? And I said, all right, God, either I'm crazy or I've really heard from you. And I remember I did get an invitation right after that. It was a church in South Carolina that met in a funeral home. <laughs> that was the first servant church I did after going off salary. And then I got another invitation from a little church in the mountains of Tennessee of less than 100 people. And so here I am. I'm coming to the end of December. My pastor is really concerned for Lisa and I. He says, this is what I want to do. Lisa, you've got television experience in your background. He says, what I want to do is I want to hire you to be the producer of my program, and I'll pay you $45 an hour. When I heard that, I about hit the ceiling. I was so happy. He said, John can build his traveling ministry, and you'll be well taken care of by your $45 an hour salary. I was so happy. I was out praying, and the Lord said, if Lisa works for him, whatever he pays for her, I will deduct out of what I give you on offerings on the road. I said, what? He said, I want her by your side. So I said, Lisa, we need to return down this offer from our pastor. So now my pastor is really excited. We are now in the last week of December. He says, John, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get you up in front of my nationwide television program and announce you to all the pastors in the country. And he said, our church is going to give you monthly support. I'm like, thank you so much, pastor. I'm out praying again. And the Lord says, he will not give you monthly support, and he will not get you up and introduce you in front of all America. I said, why not? He told me he would. And the Lord said, he is a man of the spirit and he won't do it because I'm gonna tell him not to do it. I said, why won't you let him do it? He said, because when you get in trouble, I want you running to me, not to him. So we launched out we never missed a meal. We never missed a payment. 
I remember, man, it was amazing. I'd go to this little funeral home church in South Carolina and there was a pastor from another city at the last meeting because we ended up extending the meetings. They went so powerfully. And that pastor said, hey, I got a church. Will you come to my city? Then I went over there. I remember another time, you know, we were in a situation and this is how it started happening every single month. We were in a situation where I had nowhere to go, nowhere to preach. And I was down at my parents' place down in Vero Beach and I was out in the tennis courts at about five in the morning. And I said, all right, Lord, this is not my care. It's yours. I have nowhere to preach. I have bills to pay. I have a call in my life. And I said, God, if you don't open a door, I'm going to go get a job sacking groceries. And I'm going to tell people you couldn't provide for me. <laughs> That's what I said. My knees were shaking when I said it. Do you know, I ended up right after that going to a church in Michigan, a move of God broke out that ended up going three weeks. I called my wife at the public pool in Florida. I said, Lisa, I'm sending you and Addison a ticket. I got to fly you guys up here. This thing's not stopping. There was a pastor who was listening to her phone conversation who pastored a 2000 member church in Rochester, New York. He, when she hung up, he walked over and said, I'm sorry, I was a little rude, but I listened to your phone conversation. Would your husband come to my church? So we ended up going there and we went there many, many times, but that's the way it happened. Are you listening to me? I said, are you listening to me? You know, the first year of traveling, Lisa and I watched God provide amazing ways. I remember one month we needed $700 just to pay our house payment in that first year. And I remember I said to Lisa, I said, well, our house payment's due tomorrow and we need $700. And I remember I went to the mailbox that day and there was a check for $300 from a little hippie couple that lived in Alabama. <laughs> they didn't even have furniture. They slept on just a box spring and a mattress. So they said, we don't know why, but we just felt to send this to you. Then I was preaching to a little church that night in Orlando, Florida. They had 40 people in it. And I remember the pastor said, you know what? Here's the offering. And he gave me this paper sack filled with pennies and nickels and quarters and dimes and dollar bills and all, all the cash. And I remember I was so at peace because I'd given the care to God. I went to bed and I thought, I was in bed and I thought, I didn't count the offering. Counted up the offering, it was $397.26. Add that onto the 300, it was the $700 we needed. We saw God provide for us in the most remarkable ways. Later on, I came to understand the process that God used to train us. We had to learn how to give the care to God in the small matters, like the car alternator. It was important for us to learn how to believe and fight when our salary was low. Why? Because when we were launched, we went from a low salary to no salary. Yet we'd grown in faith and we were ready for more difficult mission. The challenges we faced the first year of traveling were also beneficial to our growth for it prepared us for the next level of faith. Because now at this time, the time I'm speaking to you, our budget is basically over $100,000 a week. All right? If I hadn't learned how to give the care to God and believe him step by step in those early years, what would I do now? But I can honestly, and I mean honestly, look at you and say, I have never lost a minute of sleep over the finances for our ministry. We don't have a tithing congregation. We do not have people that give to us every week. We just have had to learn how to trust God. And you know what 100,000 is? It's just a few more zeros than where we started. But to be honest with you, the hardest part was when we first started. The 100,000 is a piece of cake compared to that first year of traveling. Are you with me? So in essence, the way God does this with us is it's basically he brings us from faith to faith and it's a process that he uses that reminds me of bodybuilding. Now, when I was 35 years old, I remember I was on a platform in Atlanta and it was a Sunday morning and I saw stars while I was preaching. Now you have to understand, I said going to the gym is a complete waste of time. That's what I said before the stars. My wife had been praying for me. God, please let John go to the gym. And because I was literally shriveling up. I was probably 20 pounds lighter than what I am right now. And our next door neighbor was a WWF wrestler. <laughs> and we were really, really close friends. His wife got saved, his children got saved. He's another story. But anyway, I remember after the star incident, I went down and I said, Kip, I said, please, would you please take me and train me? Teach me how to lift weights. He said, absolutely. And he was all happy that I was going to do it. 
And so we went to the gym for those three months. And I remember really early in my experience of going to the gym with this WWF wrestler because all his buddies would be at the gym, right? And these guys, man, their arms were as huge as my legs, okay? And they're just these Joe honking big guys, okay? And I'm just like this little stick, okay? But Kip's like so proud of me, you know? He's just like, hey, come on, John, come on. He was so good to me. And he said, now watch how we do this. And I learned really quick that you don't build muscle by putting light weight on and doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. No, you put heavy weight on the bar, just enough where you can only put up about three or four times. And I would watch these guys and they would put on all this weight and I'd watch them on the bench and and they'd go up once, they'd go up twice. The third time, I'm starting to see the blood vessels bulge. I'm starting to see the face contort and go red. And then that fourth time, all those guys are going, push, explode, push. And this guy literally's face is going pure red. His blood vessels bulging, his neck bulging, and he pushes that thing up one more time. That's when muscle begins to develop. So I started out benching 95 pounds. Don't laugh, be polite. <laughs> and I remember the first month, man, I was able to get up that at 95 pounds. And I kept going faithfully to the gym, benching my 95. Well, then it went up to 105. Then it went up to 115. Then it went up to 125. Then it went up to 145. And now Kip's like, wow, you're doing good. And then it went up to 155, 165, 175, 185. And I got stuck at 185 for a little bit of a time, but then six months later, I pushed up 205. I was so proud, I was so excited. But then I got stuck at 205 for about five years. And then what happened was this guy came to work for us in our ministry and he had been a bodybuilder. And he reminded me, he refreshed me of how to, to build, that you had to go with the heavy weights. And he started doing this with me again. Well, you know what happened? I was in this meeting in Fresno, California, and these pastors, and one of them was a bodybuilder, took me to the gym, and they said, you're gonna push up 225. I said, you're completely nuts. They said, shut up, and we're gonna spot you. Push it up. And you know what? I pushed it up. I called my wife. I was so excited, I pushed up 225. But then I got stuck on 225. And so that guy kept working with me and I got up to 235 and 245 was the biggest I'd ever done. Well, then I went to this church in Michigan that had a world-class weight training coach. And he was a faithful member and still is a faithful member of this church in Detroit. And I remember we went to the gym the day after the Sunday services and he says, now, John, we're gonna get you to push up 265 today. I said, you're nuts. He said, shut up and get on the bench and just do it. Well, you know, I pushed up 265. I was amazed. I called my wife. I was so excited. Well, then the next year I went back to the church and I kept training because he told me and the guy that worked for me what to do. And we kept doing it diligently. The next time we went back to the church, I preached all day Sunday on the Holy Spirit. Well, on Monday, I walked into the gym and this world-class trainer goes, hey, you're gonna push up. I had a dream last night. You're gonna push up 300 pounds. I said, what? You are nuts. He said, John, you preached on the Holy Spirit all day yesterday. I had a dream about it. Shut up and get down there. I said, yes, sir. You didn't argue with this guy, okay? Because he could have snapped me in half, okay? So he puts on 300. He put, does all the warm-ups, and he puts on 300. And I remember that bar coming down, and they were screaming, bosh, and I got it up. I jumped off the bench. I was jumping all over the gym. I was like, I just, he said, now you're going to do 315. I said, there is no way. He said, shut up and get down. I said, did you dream that? He said, just be quiet and do it. <laughs> so he put 315 on the bar and I pushed it at 44 years of age. I pushed up 315. I was so excited. I called my wife. I was so happy. Now, do you know what God showed me later? Those pastors, that world-class coach, that guy on my staff, they were like the Holy Spirit. Because listen to what God says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. God keeps his promise, and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, he will give you strength to endure it and also provide a way out. Those trainers knew I could not handle. They knew what I could and could not handle. They knew not to put 405 pounds on that bar when I can only push up 315. I was very impressed by their ability to see beyond what I could see. Each time I couldn't imagine myself pushing up as much as they did, they saw the strength that I didn't know was there. The Holy Spirit is the same. He knows what you can handle and he knows what you can't handle. If the WWF wrestler, listen carefully to what I'm about to say. If the WWF wrestler had put 315 pounds on that bar the first time we went to the gym, what would have happened? I'm gonna tell you what would have happened. That bar would have come down so fast and it would have crushed my ribs 
and destroyed me. I literally would have died on that bench. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit knew what was in store for Lisa and me. God says, I alone know the plans that I have for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. He had to build our faith. And in the building process, we had to learn to cast our cares upon him. It never was comfortable, but it always was beneficial. Many times I fought the emotions of wanting to quit and give up, but I just couldn't because Jesus never quit on me. We stayed steadfast in our divine mission and kept dealing with the resistance along the way. And looking back now, the low salary, the alternator problem, the various other trials we had to walk through were building blocks to strengthen us to handle what was to come. If we had to start out believing God when we first started the first year of ministry for $100,000 a week, it would have been like putting 315 pounds on the bar the first visit to the gym. No, the Holy Spirit had to steadily bring us to the place we could handle that load. So listen, don't circumvent your training. The resistance we faced in our early early years, our training process dealt with our personal needs, the fixing of the car, the money for groceries, bills, house payment. However, the resistance we face now rarely entails our personal needs. We're now fighting for the welfare of multitudes God has entrusted to our ministry. If we had circumvented God's process in the beginning, we wouldn't have had the strength for those he's sending us to now. He He would have had to get somebody else to do it. How many ministers are not able to reach the people God has called them to reach because they didn't go through the process? They didn't use their faith to push up 145 pounds on their way to 405. So now they can't handle the 405 pounds. Sadly, God had to get somebody else to complete his or her assignment. How many businessmen and women are stuck far below where God has called them because they didn't enter into rulership through the trials they faced? Instead of believing God, they went on, went to institutions of men, used manipulative or domineering techniques to overcome their trials. It is the same in the political field, educational world, in the medical profession, and the list continues. Our father knows the best training course for each of us. And though he doesn't author the hardship, he permits them in order to strengthen us for the destiny before us. Amen. Don't circumvent your training process. Listen to me carefully and never forget these words. The trials you face today are preparing you for the great feats you're going to accomplish tomorrow. I can tell you almost for sure the 10 spies didn't go through the training process Caleb and Joshua did. They more than likely found ways of getting around trials and hardships apart from believing God. They didn't build up their faith so when the life-defining moment came, they didn't have the faith to believe. Remember this, God will not bring you into a challenging place without first making available the training needed to come through it successfully. Learn to cast your cares on him in true humility so that you can go from glory to glory to glory from faith to faith to faith, and from strength to strength to strength. See you next lesson. Coming up in session nine, John encourages us to take our stand against the enemy and keep careful guard against his schemes. 